All right, so then welcome to the Plain Curves class today. We are about to prove the formula what the topological genus of a complex projective smooth curve is. So let me just to repeat, write down what the proposition is that we are started already to show, but we haven't finished it quite yet, just given the idea. Namely, the statement is that any smooth um, curve in P2 over the complex number, so any complex curve and projective curve which is smooth, um, has um, of degree D, I have to fix the degree, has genus or topological genus The number was d minus 1 choose 2, and the statement, so the topological genus was, if we draw this as a topological space, then it looks like a real surface with a certain number of holes, so it's a compact orientable surface over the real numbers, and that always has to look like this, it's like a donut with more than one hole, and the number of holes here is called the genus and that is the number of, of holes or handles or whatever you want to call it that we have. So, and for the proof, um, you already gave the idea that we want to project such a curve to a projective line. So we can assume without loss of generality that the point zero, 010 zero is not on the curve. And then we project this to a P1, a map that we called pi, so that takes the curve or the zero locus of the curve to the projective P1 and sends x, y, z to x, z. So we just drop um, the y coordinate, which means in the affine picture where the z is absent because it's just one that we just project x, y to x. But it means a picture of that would look as follows, at least in an affine picture where you have a map pi, just map the x, y plane onto the x line and there's then the curve on top here. So there's the V of F here, and there's the P1 here. So a picture of the affine part. Um, we had seen that over in general point of P1, we have D inverse image points, because the curve, of degree, the curve has degree D. So say a general point of P1, as uh, D inverse images, namely if, the, if a point, if it has the coordinate x, z, which is the given point, then the inverse images are zeros of the polynomial where we plug in x and z and consider this as a polynomial in y, a c. Um, so that is a polynomial of degree d. And hence, we expect D inverse images. So over a general point, it looks like there's so if D is 4, for example. Um, however, that is different at a finite number of points, namely whenever, so just draw the picture, but algebraically what happens is um, if the derivative of F with respect to Y is zero, then of course these zeros have a multiplicity which is not equal to one. Right? So that's a polynomial in Y, and if you have a double zero there somewhere, which means that the partial derivative is zero as well, um, then two of these zeros come together and there's not D but fewer zeros there. So, however, if um, F at the point, so x, y, z is zero, and also the partial derivative is zero at the same point, um, then um, this uh, zero has a higher multiplicity. And so there's fewer than the inverse image points. And what we can do actually is by a general coordinate transformation achieve that this actually is always only a double zero and not a higher order zero. So if we choose a general enough coordinate transformation, then this will happen. So by 
So as this is a sketch proof anyway, I don't want to be too precise on that. I mean, it's a precise statement that we can make a coordinate transformation, but we would have to show that. And I want to leave that out. So by a coordinate transformation, you can achieve that, um, that the second partial derivative at these points, so at x, y, z is then not equal to zero. That means that we have exactly a double zero at these points. Here. And that means that we have exactly d minus one inverse images instead of d. Exactly d minus one inverse images. Mm. So that means in the picture it looks like if we have such a point here, um, then two of these inverse images will come together to a point, and then it looks something like that. And uh, all this happens at various points. I can make the whole curve connected up there, but again, of course, it's only a schematic picture because it's a real picture of a complex situation. In particular, it's also, I think, something I said already last time, this is not a singular point, although it looks like, right? So locally, this is rather a complex plane wrapping by Z maps to Z squared to a complex plane, which is not a singular point up there. But that's the only way we can draw it in the, on the real plane. So um, these points we call the ramification points. Um, Well, we call these points ramification points. And um, so they happen whenever F and the partial derivative have the say have a zero at the same point. So the question is how many of these points do we have? And that's now why this is an application of Bezu. Namely, we would expect, well, the degree here is d, the degree here is d minus 1, so the Bezu number is d times d minus 1. The question might just be, I mean, what is the multiplicity with which they count in this thing? And I claim that the multiplicity is, in fact, always 1 under this assumption here, that the part, second partial derivative is not 0. So note that at these points, so at these ramification points, um, well, we had said already that f um, and df by dy are both zero, but um, I claim that the these points say p. But I claim that their intersection multiplicity is one. So mu p of f and df by dy. Is one, and so why is that? So let's compute the tangent. So multiplicity, intersection multiplicity one exactly means that if we compute the tangents, then they are both so they are both smooth curves and they have different tangents, right? So that's what intersection multiplicity one means. And so we had computed, for example, the tangent say in f line coordinates. Would we'll say p having coordinates x zero y zero. So in the plane, um, we have the formula for the tangent at the point p of f, and the formula we got this one we computed the Jacobi criterion was the partial derivative df by dx at the point times x minus x zero plus the partial derivative with respect to y at the point times y minus y zero. So that was the formula for the tangent. And um, in the same way, of course, we can write this down for the other curves, so for df by dy. So we constructed that as a polynomial, but we can still consider it as a curve. And then the tangent to the point would be the same where we replace f by its partial derivative. So here we get the second derivative with respect to x and y in formula and then plus the second derivative of f with respect to y twice 
times y minus y0. Right, so this is the formula that we had last time. Now, if we look at that, then we'll see that we had our coordinate transformation so that this second partial derivative here is non-zero. Um, so this one here, this number is non-zero. Um, whereas this here is zero. And um, of course, this then is not because our, our curve is smooth and not both of these partial derivatives can be zero. So this has to be non-zero. And if we see that, so this is non-zero here and this is zero, but this is not, this means that these two vectors here are not linearly dependent. Right? So that means they point in different directions. Um, it's different tangents. Okay, so here we have zero and here we have not equal to zero. And that means that the intersection multiplicity is in fact one at each of these points. And that means that the number of ramification points is exactly d times d minus one. It's exactly so by Bizu. degree of f times the degree of df by dy and this is d times d minus one but it means our picture the geometric picture would be like that or a complex version of that where at all but d minus d times d minus one points um, we get just the inverse image point and there's d times d minus one point that's just that, right so that's the picture um, so why do we care? We can use this now to compute this topological genus because we had seen last time that we can do this by choosing a cell decomposition. That means like we divide our space, we write down a partition of our space in terms of points and lines and disks, and then we count how many we have, how many we have. And if we form the alternating sum, number of points minus number of lines plus number of disks, then we get an invariant that doesn't depend on the cell decomposition and that is related to the, we call this the Euler number and this is related to the genus where you just take one minus the Euler number over two. So that's also something we did last time. So we can use this now to determine the topological genus of F namely as follows. So we choose a cell decomposition as last time of the target P1. Um, of P1 um, such that all the images of these ramification points are points of the cell decomposition. So again, this is a real picture, which is maybe not good, but in reality, this P1 is rather a complex P1, so it looks like a sphere. And these points here are just points somewhere on the sphere. On the sphere. So that would be a correct picture downstairs. Hmm? So what we do is like we pick a cell decomposition of that sphere of this P1 over C such that these points are points of the cell decomposition. Such that P1 over C was um, such that the images of the ramification points are among the points of the decomposition. Mm -hmm. So say this cell decomposition has a certain number of points and lines and disks. We think we called them last time sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two. So say this decomposition has um, sigma zero points, sigma one lines, and sigma one disks. 
So then the only thing that we know, I mean, there's lots of choices for sigma 0, sigma 1, but sigma 2, but we knew that the alternating sum of these numbers is fixed and only depend on that space. And we did that for a sphere actually last time, and we saw that the number that we get is 2. So the only thing we know here is that sigma 0 minus sigma 1 plus sigma 2 must be 2, um, since we have a sphere so P1 over C is this here. Um, and probably the number of points is D times Z minus 1, but we could also take more points, it doesn't matter. But at least they must be contained in that decomposition at point. Because what we want to do now is have an induced decomposition of the top space by just taking the inverse images of all the cells downstairs. Maybe if you take any point here, well, then if we have a ramification point, we see D minus one points on top. Um, if we have a general point, which is not a ramification point, we see D points on top. And if we have any line or disk, like we draw it for a line, but for a disk it's the same. So if we have any line here, then over the line, no ramification happens. So we can just uniquely lift that to a line up there and we would get exactly D lines up there as, in, as inverse images. Same for a disk, right? So if I have any disk here and you take the inverse images, you will see D disks just in each of the sheets of that covering map. So that means we now take, taking all inverse images, of these cells. We get cell decomposition of V of F. So with how many points, lines, and disks? So well, usually you would get just a D times that, so D times sigma zero, D times sigma one, D times and sigma 2, so points, lines, and disks. But um, because of the ramification points at the d times d minus 1 ramification points, you will see one inverse image point less than you actually expect. So there it's not d, but it's only d minus 1. So here we have to subtract d times d minus 1. Right? So that's because of the ramification points. Well, that means that you can again compute the Euler number up there of uh, V of F. Let me take the alternating sum and see what we get. And from that, we can then compute the genus. So that means the corresponding what we call Euler number of V of F is this alternating sum. So we take the number of points, which is D sigma 0 minus D, D minus 1. Then minus the number of lines, that's D sigma 1, and plus the number of disks, that's D sigma 2. Um, we just compute what we get. So the D factors out here, it's D times sigma 0 minus sigma 1 plus sigma 2 minus D, D minus 1. And that was 2. So that means we get a 2D minus D squared plus D, which is a 3D minus D squared. And that is the Euler number. And again, that doesn't depend on the decomposition that we picked of the P1, which would be the case. Right? Um, and from that, we saw we can compute the genus. So if we call this number, we call this chi last time, then the genus is what we call this G last time. This was 1 minus chi over 2. It was the formula that we got last time. And if we plug this in, we get my 1 minus this number, 3D minus D squared over 2. And that should just be the result that we claimed. So that is um, putting this on 1 over then we have here a d squared minus 3d plus 2, and that's exactly d minus 1. And d minus 1 times d minus 2 over 2. That is the result here.
So that's just the computational part at the end, but the main idea is just to repeat that, right? So we map this to P1 and use these cell decompositions to compute the genus. So we know a cell decomposition of P1. We can take by inverse images, we get a cell decomposition on top. For that, we have to know what it looks like. So it's close to what in topology you would call a covering map, but not quite because at D points, you have these ramification happening. And this ramification exactly leads to this correcting uh, addition here to the formula, and that will give you the genus at the end. And so that is, that's the idea here. And of course, one of the main ingredients was Bezu's theorem to figure out in how many points f and df by dy intersect, um, because that's exactly the equation that determines you the ramification points. Right, so is there... Yeah, so that was then the like the chapter of applications um, of Bezu's theorem. I mean, it will come up many more times, of course, but this is some immediate geometric consequences. And we've seen they are like of very different flavors. Well, the chapter, so it's already an interesting theorem, clearly. Um, what we want to do next is more going into the theory again of curves and what one might expect from general or well, general categories that one is maybe used to work with is that at some point one wants to talk about morphisms between these things or just maps between curves that that respect some properties in the same way as we sort of started with that here. So we had a map from a curve to P1 and some I wanted to study what that looks like. Um, in algebraic geometry, one actually does that. So, of course, that you have morphism between these varieties. Um, the point is just that here in this class, in the plane curves class, that doesn't make too much sense because our curves always come with an embedding in a P2, which is not really natural for the object itself. itself right? So, that's usually not the case in other categories. So, if like in algebraic structures, you consider groups or rings, then they are usually just groups, so abstract groups and not groups that are embedded in some other bigger group. And of course, when you then, when, then want to construct morphisms between groups, you just need the groups themselves and the embeddings would just be in your way. And you wouldn't quite know how to include that because they are actually not really relevant. But here our curves always come with such an embedding and we cannot really talk about curves without it. And so it doesn't really make much sense here to talk about morphisms between plane curves. One should rather talk about morphisms between abstract curves, which is not part, not part of this class. So there will not actually really be morphisms between curves, but what we can do is like a pre-version of that, namely consider not morphisms between curves, but from a curve just to a line or to the ground field, which would mean we consider functions on curves. And that's something that we can usefully, and um, that makes sense to do that. That will be in the, NAS, in the next chapter six, where we talk about functions um, and devices. So functions, meaning functions on curves and devices. Um, so function sort of as morphisms from a curve P to the affine or projective line and divisors is some concept that we can will then introduce later on. So that's the most that we will do into the direction of morphisms, but that's already again quite fruitful and we can do a lot of stuff with that. Um, there will be two conventions from now on. So to make this easier, um, so we assume from now on two things. Then you first of all that always the ground field should be algebraically closed from now on. Um, that makes some things clearly nicer. So the ground field 
algebraically closed. And secondly, actually, that we always have a smooth curve. So all our curves will be smooth. So both will make, have implications on the behavior of functions on the curve that we will see later on in this chapter. And it's already like interesting enough with these assumptions, so let's just do that. Um, we will, however, talk about both affine and projective curves, where, as usual, like the affine case is the preliminary version where we can just try everything out and then we'll move to the projective case. And so for today, we will pretty much consider, I guess, we'll only consider affine curves. But that we will change then next week. So for today, we only consider affine curves. And then the projective case will be done next week. So um, what that means, the setup was we'll take a smooth, um, well actually as long as we're affine, um, let me say smooth and irreducible, so for the projective case that's implicit then, every smooth curve is irreducible. Um, for let me just report and irreducible. So for in the affine case, you could have smooth and non-irreducible curves like two parallel lines or something like that. So we also don't want that. Um, so the setup is that we have such a smooth and irreducible curve over an algebraically closed field, and we want to talk about functions on that, so meaning functions to the ground field. And so that is the, and that is actually a nice geometric and also algebraic construction that we had seen already, like in a couple of remarks. Um, and that leads to the definition of so-called coordinate rings. In these, so say we let F be an affine curve, meaning so as by our assumptions, so smooth, irreducible, and over an algebraically closed field. And first of all, algebraically, we call, we define the coordinate ring of F be the quotient of the polynomial ring by the ideal generated by F. So the coordinate ring of F is defined to be the notation is A of F, I think pretty much a standard notation for that, is the coordinate ring KXY modulo, the ideal generated by F. So that's like the algebraic, um, the algebraic definition. And so let's just start right away with the, I mean, that has an obvious or semi-obvious, let's say, geometric interpretation of that. Namely, if we have an element of this coordinate ring, um, then this is given by the class of a polynomial, modulo f, and that means every polynomial defines a polynomial function and um, it actually, even if you mod it out by f, that would define a well-defined polynomial function on the curve. For every f, little f in A of capital F, um, where we might prefer to put a bar on that, like a class modulo capital F, I usually drop that and rather write element of A of F, then we know it's in the quotient. Um, so every little f in there um, is hence a polynomial, and it defines a well, oh, well defined polynomial function on V of F. Right? Because if you change it by 
something in the ideal, then whatever is in the ideal vanishes on V of f, and so it would give you the same function. Right? So if f, say if f bar equals g bar, or if just f equals g in A of f, um, that would mean that the difference f minus g is capital F times something times h, and that means on V of f, that f of p minus g of p, f of p h of p is um, zero, or oh, it's not zero, this is zero, f of p, or p in v of f, and that means that little f and little g is the same. Hmm? So that means these elements can be thought of as polynomial functions on f, um, and actually, one thing that we have already as an implication of the field being algebraically closed is that the other way around works as well. Um, you really know that this already happens for just ordinary polynomials in one variable and not in the context of curves, that polynomials and polynomial functions agree um, already for infinite fields, actually. And... Um, the same is true here. So, conversely, mm, and now we have two well-defined polynomial functions. Like, if the functions are the same, um, then they would also be the same element. Conversely, if f and g in A of f fine, same function on v of f, then this means that whenever I am on f, then the two polynomials agree. That means that if I'm in the zero locus of f, then I'm also in the zero locus of f minus g. That's one way of saying that. And so f minus g vanishes on capital F. And that means, of course, that f divides little f minus little g. So we saw that. If we have, for example, an algebraically closed field, we saw that in the first chapter. And that means that f minus g is in the ideal of f, and hence they are the same in A of f. And what that means is just that we can also think of A of f geometrically as the ring of polynomial functions on V of f. Well, it means we have a nice algebraic description and a nice geometric description. What's the ring of polynomial functions on V of F? That's the that's somehow the the central the the, the key object to start with here. Mm. So what's the algebraic properties? What are the algebraic properties of this thing? Um, well, if we restrict to our irreducible case, for, for that we only need irreducible, then what we mod out is the ideal generated by an irreducible element, and you probably know that this means that the quotient would be an integral domain. Right? So that's the main property that we get here for which we need irreducibility. Mark. Um, say algebraic properties. of ordinate ring of A of F, namely A as capital F is irreducible from actually A of F is an integral domain. Oh, thank you. I mean, that's sort of clear, right? So if F times G is zero in A of F, that would mean that f um, times g is zero in the quotient, which means that capital F divides f times g, but f is irreducible, hence it's also prime when factorial ring here, so that f divides f or f divides g, and this means that f is zero or g is zero in A of f. So that's 
very simple, right? Or if you've seen it like from commutative algebra, we mod out a prime ideal. So that means we get an integral domain. Um, but that's pretty much it. So what we had from the um, case of the ordinary polynomial ring, so one of the key properties of the ordinary, ordinary polynomial ring, which we've been using all the time, is that it's a factorial ring. So that means we have a unique prime decomposition of its elements. And um, that, unfortunately, is no longer true. That's not a property that passes to quotients. And um, so that means A of F does usually not have this property. So sometimes it does and sometimes it's not. And it's actually, in, even in concrete situations, quite a hard task to figure out whether it is a factorial ring or not. So we, the statement here is, I mean, we're not going into details how to check this, but we can just not assume this. So it's well, actually more an algebraic non-property. Um, so usually, um, let me just note that A of F is not factorial. So that means we have no factorization, let alone a unique factorization into primes. And that makes sometimes working with these coordinate rings a little, little hard, and we would rather want to replace them by nicer objects, and we'll just do that today. And we have local versions of that thing that actually behave nicer than, than the rings here. Um, yeah. So well, that's the thing to start with. Um, now that's just polynomial functions, but as you probably know, if we want to, even if we are staying with an algebra, it's sensible to consider also quotients of polynomials as functions on curves, as long at least as the denominator is not zero, in the same way as we did it, say, for the local rings of a plane, for example. And we want to do the same here. And now pass. rational functions and that's very similar to the affine case that we had before in we saw we consider definition um, namely rational functions essentially and related to that local rings So we had a similar thing for the affine plane itself without considering a curve, but now we do it for a curve. So that means the situation is that we have F be a curve. And um, an affine curve, so as always today. And of course, smooth and irreducible. So then part A, we can consider, as this is an integral domain, we can, as usual, form its quotient field. And that will be called the field of rational functions. Quotient field, or well, the standard notation for that would be K of F. And that's just the quotient field um, A of F. So that means the elements are of the form form of fractions. So f over g with f and g and a of f and g is not zero. Um, that's called the field of rational functions. Mm -hmm. So we did that before for the affine plane as well. There we took the quotient field just with the polynomial ring. Just have to remember that this doesn't share the nice properties in the sense, I mean, it's still a field, but um, it doesn't have this unique factorization property. So the quotient field um, is called field rational function. On F. Mm. 
So the elements of that should be hence functions on the curve, at least unless the denominator is not zero. And the way to trace is that we say um, a rational function And usually, um, I will denote this by a letter by small Greek letters, usually phi. A rational function phi on f is called regular at a point p, where p should be a point on f. Mm -hmm. If we can write it in such a way, f over g, um, such that g of p is not equal to zero. Regular if R F G and A of F with G of P is not zero and I is F over G. Um, all these rational functions do form a subring of K of F because we can add them, we can multiply them. Um, for the regular functions at P. Form a subring of KF, and that is a. The notation for that will be O F comma P. So we had so far an O A two comma P. So that was pretty much the same thing. Namely, inside the field of rational functions, all those where the denominator is not equal to zero. Um, so. That is just, well, we can write down explicitly what this is. This is all the f over g in kf, such that g of p is not equal to zero. And that will be called, hence, the ring of regular functions, or also the local ring at p. So again, we'll see also in a minute that this is a local ring also in the algebraic sense. Of course, it's a very similar construction to the A2 case. Um, so, and these are now then exactly those rational functions where you could assign a value at the point P, namely just by plugging that in. So there is an evaluation morphism, like a ring homomorphism from OFP to the ground field. And then f over p to f of p over g of p. And that's the last part. Mm. There is an evaluation of homomorphism. Evaluation. Oh, that's the ring homomorphism. from um, this OFP to the ground field K, that sends an F over G to F of P over G of P. Right, so we always, we do have a representation now with that being not equal to zero, so we can do that. And um, we'll write this as, of course, if we just write this as a letter phi for the quotient, I will also call this phi of P. Um, written phi maps to phi of p. Mm. And that has a kernel in the same way as in the, in the case of the plane, which we call an i of fp. That's an ideal inside there. Taking the corresponding notation here, we'll call this i f comma p. And that we could write as all f over g in, um, in OFP or in K of X, in K of F doesn't matter, um, let's write in K of F, such that F of P is zero and G of P is not zero. So these are exactly those quotients where the evaluation is zero at this point. Um, no, so that's the evaluation, we have that as well, and that leads to an ideal here which is the IFP. So it's a very similar construction to that, that what we did in the plane.
Mm. Maybe first of all, one algebraic remark here, as we call this local ring, in case you know that from commutative algebra, that is again a local ring as in the sense of commutative algebra, because this is essentially the localization of um, no, they want to say is it, has, it does have a unique maximal idea, and that is just x minus the point, make my, x minus x zero and y minus y zero. Um, and we do actually obtain this by localization. That's a different way of saying that by starting with a of f and localize at the ideal of the point, which is x minus x zero, y minus y zero. So, actually, um, in case you know this. Um, this OFP is again as in the case of the plane, and the argument is also again is the same as in the plane, a local ring in the algebraic sense. For example, as it is the localization um, of the polynomial ring, uh, of the of the coordinate ring of AFF at the ideal x minus x zero y minus y zero, if x zero and y zero are the coordinates of the point. And another way of saying that it has a unique maximal idea, which is this IFP. So IFP is. is its unique maximal idea. Um, so that's just the algebraic, algebraic setting. So these are the objects that we want to uh, construct, to consider now. And as in the same way as we had this ring of regular functions, or the, the first, oh, no, not the ring of regular functions, but the polynomial functions, so the coordinate ring, we could think of them as polynomial functions, so the elements here by the evaluation map define at least, or they define sort of functions in the neighborhood of the point in a similar way as we had this for, um, for the plane. What we did with that in the plane was to define um, intersection multiplicities of two polynomials, so at the beginning, like of the second chapter. And now what we do here, the natural thing to do here is again do something like intersection multiplicities, but take this capital F that is already in the construction as one of the polynomials, which means now we only take one rational or regular function and define a multiplicity of that function at a point. So, which we can think of as sort of defining zeros or poles of functions on a curve. Now, what we want to do now is the construction um, of multiplicities of, say, regular or in general, more general rational functions and at given points. So that means we we start with a curve as before, an affine curve, and have a fixed point on that. We'll say that f be an affine curve. And p is a point on that. Then well, we do that construction in two steps. And first of all, let me talk about a like of a function in the coordinate ring, so in A of f, and then we pass to k of f. Um, so for A, say let little f be an element in the coordinate ring, so a polynomial function of that, of, of f, on f. And then we can define a multiplicity of this little f considered as function on capital F to be the intersection multiplicity of those two things. Um, so we define the multiplicity of little f on capital F as, and so the notation will also be, I also call this mu p, but now I have only one argument, namely this function, as the capital F is implicit, as this is a function on capital F, 
and we define this to be the intersection multiplicity of capital F with little f. And that, of course, gives, as usual, in the intersection multiplicity, a natural number or maybe infinity. Um, so there's one implicit statement, of course, that this is well defined, namely if I mean, this is a class after all, but that means if two have if two polynomials share the same class, that means their difference is capital F times something. And we had seen that if we add to little f a capital F times something, that doesn't change this number. Hmm? Okay, this is well defined. Namely, if f is g in a of f then this means that in as polynomials, f minus g would be um, of the form capital F times h for some h, and this in kxy. So that means if I now take the p of f comma, um, what is it, um, g plus little f is the same as mu p of f and then g plus fh, and there we know that this is what was one of the properties of intersection multiplicities, that this is the same as um, capital F little g. Right? So that means it is actually well defined by all properties of the intersection multiplicity. Um, moreover, two more things about this. This is, so I said here, it's a natural number or infinity. So when is it infinity? Um, we know that the intersection multiplicity is infinite if and only if these two curves share a common component, even through the point at P. But if F is irreducible, then sharing a common component just means that this is a multiple of F. But if it's a multiple of F, then it's zero in A of F. So that means the only regular, the only uh, element of the coordinate ring where this is infinite is zero. Hmm? So also note... Um, mu p of f um, is zero if and only if capital F and little f have a common component, which as capital F is irreducible only happens if it's actually a factor, but then little f is already zero. So the zero function is the only element that has an infinite multiplicity in that sense. Um, so if capital F is irreducible, um, this is the same as capital F divides F, which is the same as little f is zero in A of F. So, only the zero function has an infinite, an infinite multiplicity. This is infinite if that is zero. Um, and one last note is that we have this additivity of intersection multiplicities, if you recall. Right? So if we have a intersection multiplicity of capital F with a product of two things, then we just have, we can split this off into two factors and get the sum of the intersection multiplicities. And this means, of course, that this multiplicity here uh, is as well. That is the multiplicity of little f. And moreover, um, we have that mu p of fg is mu p of capital F fg, and there we know one of the properties of our intersection multiplicities, what well, this is mu p f of mu p fg, and this is mu p of f that's mu p of g. So we have an additivity of these intersect of these multiplicities of functions here as well. Um, so that is for polynomial functions. But of course, we want to extend this now to rational functions. And that's quite, I mean, in the formal setting, that's quite easy because a rational function is just a quotient of these two things. And so we just do that for the numerator and the denominator and take the difference of the two by definition, essentially. Now, say let i um, be a rational function, so not necessarily regular at the point, so phi and k of f, mm. and then, so we can write this as phi as f over g, 
my definition of k of f, well, not unique, but in some way. So this is f over g, then we define again the multiplicity now of phi on f by oh say p of phi is just u p of f minus u p of g. And um, of course now as g is in the denominator, g cannot be the zero function. So that is clearly not equal to zero. And that means that the case of infinite multiplicity cannot happen for g, but it can happen for f. And so that means that this is a, an integer or infinity. And that's the result that we can get there as well. Um, we could check the same things as before. First of all, this is well defined not in a different way as here, so well-defined in the sense that there's, of course, different ways of representing the same function as quotients of two things. Again, saying this is well-defined. Namely, if say f over g is the same as some f prime over g prime um, in a of f, then that means, oh, we have in the quotient field of an integral domain, so this just means fg prime is gf prime. And then, meaning we get taking mu p of that and using the additivity, we have mu p of f um, plus mu p of g prime is the same as mu p of um, fg prime. That's same as mu p of f prime g. Um, and that's now the same as mu p of f prime plus mu p of g prime, right? uh, of g. And if I subtract the primes here, then I get that mu p of f minus mu p of f prime is mu p of g minus mu p of g prime. So that means the, uh, or I should do it in the other way, f minus g is f prime minus g prime. That's the way I should do it. And then I get the same expression here. It's actually well defined. Down, so this means mu p of f minus mu p of g. That is the definition for f over g is the same as mu p of f prime minus mu p of g prime, and that would be the definition for f prime over g prime. So that's just by construction well defined. We can also note the other two things. So when is this infinite? It's infinite if and only if f is zero, which means again that we have the zero function. Note again as above, um, mu p of phi is zero if and only if phi is zero. And the second thing, we also have the additivity because it's additive for f and g, so it's additive for f over g by definition. So that means mu p of phi times some psi, some other function, is mu p of phi plus mu p of phi. And um, what this means together is that this mu p now gives actually a group homomorphism from the field of rational functions without zero. So we should take out zero because then the result would be infinite. Again, I wrote zero. Infinite. So we want to take that one out and then go to the integer. So then the result will actually be an integer. And the second property just means it's a group homomorphism. So the, of course, the intuitive, the geometric interpretation of that is that it shows you whether you have a zero or a pole of the corresponding functions. And correspondingly, we will call now E a zero or a pole of such a rational function if this number has is has the appropriate value. So we say that P is a zero of order n 
would be a natural number greater than zero if this mu p of um, phi or zero of phi of order n, um, if this is n, and we say that p is a pole of order n if mu p of phi is minus n. Right? And that also shows you already what the geometric interpretation is. So we have defined functions on that on the curve and the ordinary notion of like what you think zero and pole means is just extended to that. I guess that's what I wanted to say about this construction here. Um, yeah. So we can do one example where we can see already that I mean that is quite an intuitive concept, but um, there can be things happening that are maybe not expected and that arise from that fact that for A of F is not a factorial ring. Um, namely, let's have a look at the following example. So for that, as in the notes, I took for a capital F a shifted circle. So that is y squared plus y um, plus x squared. Um, it's just some smooth quadratic curve um, in the plane, um, which you can, I guess, write as y plus one half squared minus one quarter something plus x squared. So you can see it's essentially a circle which is shifted downwards in the plane. Um, and the picture looks like that. So that would, if I draw a real picture, um, which is sort of a K, even although I'm in the complex case here. You want to be algebraically close, so that is V of F. Um, and I want to consider the regular, the rational function of phi is y over x. It means it's a quotient, as I've written it down, it's a quotient of two polynomials, and both polynomials are zero at this point, I'll be considering. Right? So that means as it stands, it looks as if this is not a regular function, right? because the denominator is zero. But let's compute the multiplicity at that point, and there we can just do with our ordinary methods. Um, so if we're at the origin, so at zero, um, we get that mu zero of, oh, by definition, we have to consider the numerator and the denominator separately. So mu zero of y is the intersection multiplicity at the zero point of this curve here. So y squared plus y plus x squared um, with y, which means that we can drop all the y's here. So we get x squared y, and that is two. And if I have mu zero of x, then I have to take mu zero of the curve again, y squared plus y plus x squared comma x, then we can drop all the x's, so we get mu zero of y squared plus y x, and as there the leading term has to be one, this is just one, um, which is not too surprising because y is actually the tangent of the curve, right? So y is y equals zero is, is that horizontal line, and that's the tangent of the curve, and x is zero is that line, and that's not the tangent of the curve. So we must sort of get this, right? but we also get this from the computation. And that means by definition, actually, um, that the multiplicity, um, so mu at the origin of phi, is just two minus one, which is one. Right? Um, Um, so that means we would say in the above definition that this function has a pole, it has a has a order um, has an order one zero. I has a zero of order one at zero yeah. by definition. Um, however, what might look a bit weird is that the function as it stands doesn't even look to be defined at the point right? because we have something that's zero over something that's zero 
So the question is, I mean, does that actually, does that definition make sense? Is it sort of the right thing? Hmm? So because a zero of a function would, I guess you would imply sort of at least from your, from your intuition that it's at least a function where you could plug in the point and then get zero value. And um, let's study that a little. And in fact, it will turn out, yeah, well, there is a different way of representing the same function um, that this is not obvious. It's just because it's not a unique factor. It's not a, uh, it's not a factorial thing. So that means these factors do not have to appear in the decomposition of that function. There's different ways to represent the same function that really look totally different and are just not obtained by multiplying the numerator and denominator by the same factor. And um, so let's quickly study that. So what's the question essentially, so what is the relation between being a regular function so that I can actually um, define its value at the point and say having an order of or, um, or a multiplicity of at least zero or in that case of multiplicity one. And one direction there is actually quite obvious, so remark. Um, note that if you have an element that's not just a rational function, but actually in the local ring, so that means I can write it as f over g, where g does not vanish, right? Then this means, of course, that g has multiplicity zero at the point, right? It's not even a point on the curve, it doesn't vanish. And so that means in the definition mu p of f minus mu p of g, you don't have to subtract anything, and you would clearly get a non-negative result. So that's somehow the obvious direction. Right? So if, um, say, phi is even in uh, OFP, so if this is a not just a rational but a regular function at p, then we can write um, phi is f over g with g of p is not equal to zero. And hence, mu p of um, phi, which is mu p of f minus mu p of g. Um, so then this number here will be zero, as g of p is not equal to zero. And what I get here is, um, is a natural number, right, for infinity if we have the zero function. Um, so in particular, it's non-negative. Right? Now that means mu p of phi is greater or equal to zero. Um, actually, that implies that if we have a unit, which means that there is also that there is an inverse that you have the same argument the other way around, and it's also less than or equal to zero, so it must be zero. Moreover, if phi is a unit. Then, so then there is a phi of minus one, and that means that mu p of phi of minus one is greater than or equal to zero as well. But that phi uh, multiplicity mu p was a group homomorphism, so that means that's the same as minus mu pi of phi, and so that means in that case the multiplicity is zero. So that's all of you, how everything that you would expect, right? So if you think about it as a regular function, so there's no denominator you don't have, or at least there's nothing that's zero in the denominator, you would expect that you have a multiplicity of at least zero. And if it's a unit, so that means the numerator also doesn't vanish, then you have zero multiplicity of that function. So then that means you don't have a zero, you don't have a pole, it's just multiplicity zero. Um, the interesting question is whether the converse also holds, right? So whether I can use the, this multiplicity of a rational function to detect whether it's actually in the local ring. But does the converse also hold? No, namely that means if mu p of phi is greater or equal to zero, is then necessarily phi in OFP. 
Oh, that means, can I write it as f over g where g is not equal to zero? And that is not obvious. And you think that it is not obvious, you can see in this example. Because you have a function y over x, a rational function, that does have a positive, even positive multiplicity at the point, but it's not visibly written as a quotient of two things where the denominator is not zero. So this is not obvious. Um, let me see examples above. Um, but fortunately, it turns out it is true. Um, and that is again, and that's now the point where we have to use that we are on a smooth curve and we're again this notion of a um, uh, what, what we consider that we consider a local ring of a smooth curve which already occurred with this term like a discrete valuation ring so, um, in case you heard this from commutative algebra and that's a I think I mentioned this a couple of times already but always said, well, we don't really need this from commutative algebra. But the following statement essentially tells you that it is, and hence I would like to call this proposition that this is um, a discrete valuation ring. I put this in quotes because you don't have to know the definition, but if you know the definition, then you will realize that the statement of the proposition is exactly the definition. Um, so the following is proposition. Well, the name of this will be well, our OFP is a discrete valuation ring. And that says the following. So that F for P be a point on a curve. On a curve F. And then there's two statements. Namely, first of all, that this ideal IFP that we considered as a so as the kernel of the evaluation, so IFP and OFP, um, that is actually a principal ideal. Um, so that means it can be generated by one element. I'll call this T. So IE um, IFP is generated by one element T or some T in IFP. Um, and of course, that means that this T is also unique up to units, right? That's in general, I mean, two elements would define the same ideal if they only they differ by a unit. So this T is clearly unique up to units. Um, and that also that has usually a name, we would call this a local coordinate or a local parameter on F. That's the point P. Local parameter, it's the same. Um, parameter of f at the point p. Mm. And in what sense this is a local coordinate is made clear in b, namely that any element in k of f, so any rational function, can be written pretty much uniquely as a, well actually uniquely, as a unit times this t to some power. And that's of course corresponds to if you really consider this as a local coordinate in the sense in the manifold sense, so to say. So it's locally a one-dimensional manifold. So there should be one coordinate on that. And then you would expect that you can write any function, expand it like in a well, power series or polynomial and take the leading term off. And that is exactly what happens here. So just the point is, of course, that the implicit function theorem is false in algebra, so we cannot really use that for the proof. But the intuition is that, and the statement is still true. So that is B, like any element, 
and actually any non-zero elements for the zero function it doesn't work so any non-zero element phi in k of s um, has can be written uniquely as um, phi is c times t to the n or a unit c and um, so as and like and a uh, natural number and an integer n and n and z um, and that is for a fixed t of course i mean so that i said almost uniquely in the sense of course t was well defined only up to units so if you multiply a unit into that t you would just multiply that also into that c so if i really want to say unique then this means that for a fixed choice of t and in fact this number n here mm, is just that multiplicity so they mean for n equals mu p of phi And this mu p. Mm. And well, if t is fixed and n is fixed, then clearly c is fixed. Right? Um, so that already somehow says if we have that, then we know the uniqueness part. And in particular, that means, of course, that the question of that up there is yes, namely if that means if the mu p of phi is greater than or equal to zero, then I can write phi as c times t to the n, where n is a non-negative number and t is in the ring and c is in the ring, so it's in the ring. So in particular, this implies that um, mu p of phi is that if this is greater than zero then phi is actually in OFP and we have seen already that the other direction holds as well right so I can put that the direction there works as well but the somewhat the hard one where we when we ask here if this is true is actually true because of that um, and that as I said definitely needs the smoothness part of the whole thing and also, as I said, so if you know from commutative algebra what a discrete valuation ring is, then this together is one way of defining what a discrete valuation ring is. I mean, there's many, many different uh, equivalent definitions, and that's one of them. So I hope you would have seen it then in that case. So, um, yeah, let's show that. So how do we prove that? Okay. Mm, we can actually say quite explicitly what that t should be. And we do have a smooth curve. And the only thing that we need to do is we take a line to the point that's not the tangent. Um, the a, pick, or t, mm, a line through p, that is not epf. And that means, of course, that the multiplicity, um, so it means that mu pf of f and t, which we call mu p of t, is 1. Right? So that means we have another curve, which actually happens to be a line, and the multiplicity is 1. So it has a simple 0 at that, at that part. And that, I claim, is OK. We can take this. Of course, there's many choices. We say it's unique only up to units, so there's many choices. And the claim is for that we have this equality. And why is that true? So then, um, that's actually pretty much a numerical statement because, um, well, first of all, it's a line through P. So that means P clearly lies in the ideal of F at P. So then T is an IFP. 
And if I just consider dimensions, so then we say y1 is mu p of um, ft. Um, or mu p of t. Which is the dimension of, um, well, I mean, the original definition was to take O a2, comma p modulo ft. And actually, um, it's a sort of easy exercise to show if you were in commutative algebra, you know this already, um, is that the um, localization that we, we took here commutes with quotient, so that is actually the same as the dimension of O f p. So where you take the quotient first and then localize and mod out by t. Um, so that is actually a commutative algebra statement. You computer, consider it as an exercise here. Um, maybe we put this as an exercise, or maybe you just know. So this is just from commutative algebra. Um, namely that, um, so essentially it's not just the dimensions that are the same, but the rings are isomorphic, namely that uh, localization commutes with quotients. Um, well, now T is in the ideal. So that means the idea generated by T is contained in IFP. And that means if we want to compare this to the dimension of OFP modulo IFP, um, then this is greater or equal to, right? Because T lives, so this is this ideal is contained in that one. So this is because T is contained in IFP. And the dimension of that is at least one, right? Because we have, for example, the constant functions that are in there that are not modded out. So that means that's at least one. And then we have a chain here of inequalities saying one on both sides. So that means we must have equality everywhere, in particular between those two. And that means that the ideal generated by T is exactly I. So this is greater or equal continuing here into one because one in uh, OFP or IFP is non-zero. It's a non-zero element. So the dimension is at least one. And so this means we must have equality. And that means that IFP is actually equal to that ideal generated by t. So for that, but for that definitely we need the smoothness assumption because if f was not smooth at the point, then we wouldn't find any element that has intersection multiplicity one, right? If one of the curves is already singular, then we get at least two, and that doesn't work. So that is the part a, mm. and for part b, the idea is essentially we do that. So if we start with phi. Um, we start with one representation of SF, of SF over G, and then we use our comparison of ideal statement. And we do the following thing. Um, so for B, mm, let's say, so let phi be an element in K of F, uh, not zero, K F star. Um, so that means we can write it as phi as F over G, or F and G in A of F. Mm. Then, if we consider f for a moment only, then we have a certain multiplicity of that, which is the intersection multiplicity of capital F with little f. Um, so then, or m, say, um, equals the multiplicity of f. At the point P, um, we have that um, the if you consider the multiplicity of F, then this is M, and that happens to be the same as um, as that of T to the M. Hmm? We can take that one. Mm -hmm. So we have um, P of and equal to m, and that would be the same as mu p of t to the m. 
because t has multiplicity one and it's multiplicative, so we take t to the m also gives you m. Um, so that means, as we had seen in our like, comparing ideal statement, yeah, we had seen that in, as ideals of the local ring of A2, if you take a capital F together with F or capital F together with T to the M, then you get the same ideal actually, um, if and only if the intersection multiplicities are the same. There was also a statement where we needed smoothness and where we compared ideals using intersection multiplicity. I think that's what we called it. Using intersectional, intersectional multiplicities. That told us that um, capital F and little f is the same as capital F e to the m. So at that point in this chapter, we didn't talk yet about the local rings of the curve. So it looked like that. Um, that in O a to p and that of course we can now write as the ideal of f is the same as the ideal of t to the m um, in o f p and if those ideals are the same that means f is just the unit times t to the m hmm? or unit c and do the same for g and find the representation g is t to the um, m, some other number. And that gives you together the description that we want. So say in the same way. R is the multiplicity at the point P of G, so in the denominator. Um, that make sense? Yeah. We get that G is again D times, say, T to the R or unit D. And then if we take the quotient, so F over G, is then of course C over D, which is again the unit times C to the uh, T the m minus r and that we set our number n. Eh? So this is d over d times d to the n with an integer n in z. Eh? And that gives you the second part I guess. And we can write it is in that form or not get the uniqueness part we can, but we can write it in that form. But of course if we just if we have an equation like that and apply a mu p on both sides then we get clearly n here because the mu p here is 0 plus n times 1 and we get mu p of uh, phi here. So that, so, if you, so strictly speaking, that gives you existence. Um, but also, if we have such a representation, phi is d times t to the n, and we apply mu p to that, um, then we clearly have here mu p of phi is mu p of c times t to the n, which is mu p of c plus n times mu p of t, and this is 1 and this is 0, so this is just n. And so this means the number n is clearly unique, so if we can do it, it's unique. And if, as I said, if n is unique and phi is given, then c is unique. So that also gives unique. And so that's Again, like a nice interpretation of smoothness, this manifold interpretation that we say on a smooth curve. So we do not have something like the implicit function theorem in analysis, but we can still say that there is a local coordinate on that thing and that every function can be written as, as if it was a power series, so to say. Right? So you have a unit times and then a leading power of that coordinate. And that will, that will then, I guess the time is up. Yeah, so that will exploit them more in the next week, like in one or two statements, and then continue to pass on to the protective case and then study somehow that space of functions on protective for the next week. That's okay.
up here, I guess. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's it for today then.